after a non-stop flight from the nation's capital, President Truman is greeted by Governor Waldron as he reaches Olympia, Washington, where he was a guest at the governor's mansion during his four-day stay. Charles Ross, the president's secretary, holds an impromptu conference with the newspaper men. At the Washington State Capitol, the president performs one of the pleasant tasks of his vacation tour when he decorates Sergeant John D. Hawk of Bremerton, Washington, with the Congressional Medal of Honor. It's just possible that the president's borrowed Indian sweater scared off the Puget Sound fish because the one he's holding is just posing for the picture. But his hard luck doesn't seem to dampen the fun he's having on his first vacation since taking office. And anyway, telling about the ones that got away is just as good. Well, almost. Another of the president's excursions is a trip to Mount Rainier, one of the nation's most beautiful national parks. It's a far cry from Washington's heat to six feet of snow at this 5,000-foot elevation. You can see the president is really enjoying that vacation. President Harry S. Truman and Secretary of State Statinius meet at San Francisco to take part in the final ceremonies of the United Nations Conference on International Organization. For nine work-packed weeks, representatives of the 50 member countries have labored in the cause of peace, and the president is here to witness the signing of the new World Security Charter. <laughs> It's the president's first visit to the Golden Gate, and San Francisco really takes him to her heart. <laughs> Mr. Truman goes to his Knob Hill headquarters before addressing the peace-loving nations who have welded the document, based on the Dumbarton Oaks formula and the various talks between Churchill, Stalin, and Franklin Roosevelt. Visiting President Truman is Admiral Nimitz, who receives congratulations on the great string of victories credited to his command in the Pacific, where the cause of peace will be further advanced by the defeat of Japanese aggression. At a history-making session, Britain's Lord Halifax asked for a rising vote of delegation chairman to finally approve the charter as drafted. Everyone present is in full agreement that this document exceeds all expectations. And led by Secretary Statinius, the vote of approval is unanimous. In a special room, surrounded by the flags of the United Nations, China's delegation, headed by their ambassador to England, Dr. Wellington Koo, is the first to sign. The first of 153 signers of these solemn documents. Russian ambassador Alexander Gromyko also approves the charter and the preparatory plan and is followed by Lord Halifax for Britain. Cameramen make a permanent record for history while Paul Boncourt heads the French delegation. And then the United States group enters, headed by Mr. Statinius, while President Truman beams his approval. Shortly after, Statinius resigned from the State Department and was appointed to carry on this important work for the President. After Senate ratification, he will become United States member of the Security Council. Meanwhile, introduced by Secretary Statinius, the President officially ends the conference. The President of the United States of America. The Charter of the United Nations, which you are now signing, is a solid structure upon which we can build for a better world. History will honor you for it. Between the victory in Europe and the final victory in Japan, in this most destructive of all wars, you have won a victory against war itself. If we had had this charter a few years ago, and above all, the will to use it, Millions now dead would be alive. If we should falter in the future, 
in our will to use it, millions now living will surely die. What you have accomplished in, the San, in San Francisco shows how well these lessons of military and economic cooperation have been learned. You have created a great instrument for peace and security and human progress in the world. The world must now use it. With this charter, the world begin, can begin to look forward to the time when all worthy human beings may be permitted to live decently as free people. This new structure of peace is rising upon strong foundations. Let us not fail to grasp this supreme chance to establish a worldwide rule of reason, to create an enduring peace under the guidance of God. cheered by the results of the conference, the president is further cheered by crowds in his old hometown, Independence, Missouri, his first appearance there since assuming the presidency. The summer White House, the Truman's Independence home, looks mighty good to the chief executive after many weeks of arduous work, work that will never cease until final peace is won. President Truman nears the end of his sea voyage on the USS Augusta, commanded by Captain Foskett. Accompanying the president on the history-making trip to Potsdam is Secretary of State Burns. During the voyage up the English Channel, the British cruiser Birmingham and several destroyers provide an honor escort. Mr. Truman debarked at Antwerp, Belgium, and was flown to his momentous conference near Berlin, where he met Prime Minister Churchill and Marshal Stalin. The President thanks officers of the Augusta for his pleasant trip, which was made in exceptionally fine weather. Never out of touch with the nation's affairs, he watches the White House mail pouch taken aboard from a courier boat. Prior to landing, Mr. Truman confers with Secretary Burns and Admiral Leahy who will be his two chief aides in a meeting which may well determine history for generations. However, the president takes time out to enjoy some of that good Navy chow with the seamen. The man on whose shoulders rest the crushing responsibilities of the coming conference and the winning of a war against Japan takes time to eat and chat with American sailors. He is the president of a democracy.